So hello everyone and welcome to today's event um, on climate adaptation and resilience vision, what will success look like in 2021. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Salim al Hook, who, who is the director for the International Centre for Climate Change and Development and who is going to be our moderator for today's session. Thanks very much. Over to you, Salim. Thank you very much, Juliet. And let me add my welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, to all of you for joining us uh, for this very interesting uh, session that we're going to hold. My name is Salim al Haq. Uh, please call me Salim. Uh, I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this discussion uh, today with a number of very interesting speakers, and I will also be uh, co-helped uh, by, uh, particularly by Vel, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, this is a, a one of a series of uh, webinars and se sessions that we are holding together with my center ICAD in Bangladesh and IID in London. Uh, and on the overall theme of climate and collaboration we need. And this particular one is on adaptation and resilience. In particular, what are we looking for out of COP26 and 2021 uh, more broadly as a year and then going beyond 2021. Uh, I'll just set the scene a little bit in terms of where we stand at the moment, and then I'll introduce our six speakers and my uh, co-discussant. Uh, uh, and then we will do the spe speeches or the interventions in groups of three. There'll be an initial uh, um, three minute uh, pitch from each of the uh, panelists, uh, three panelists at a time. We will then have a conversation with them and then we will move on to the next set of three panelists, have a conversation with them, and then hopefully we will have around 20 minutes uh, after everybody has spoken to take some questions uh, from the audience. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat box, they will be monitored and my colleague uh, Ebony will be uh, selecting and, and passing them on to me uh, to put to the panelists uh, when you want to uh, ask the questions. So just to set the scene, as everybody knows, COP26 had to be postponed because of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic from November 2020 to November 2021. Uh, we are still hoping that it will be an in-person physical event in Glasgow in November 2021, uh, but one never knows for sure. It's, uh, I think, perhaps too early to make that uh, uh, determination right now. Uh, but certainly what we do don't, do not want is another one year postponement and putting everything off for another year. So we really do want to use this time uh, to move things forward. Uh, as I'm sure everybody is aware, December 31st, uh, 2020 was the timeline for countries to submit their nationally determined contributions. 110 countries did submit their NDCs. Uh, the Vulnerable Countries Forum, which is led by Bangladesh, the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina of Bangladesh, led a big uh, um, midnight for survival campaign to get countries uh, to submit their NDCs on time. And many of them did. A few are left, but we hope they'll come soon. The other good news is the uh, US presidential election result with President Biden uh, taking climate change seriously, re-entering the Paris Agreement, appointing John Kerry as his climate envoy, and also uh, taking very substantial efforts at uh, taking climate change as a major activity in the United States going forward uh, in his national agenda. Uh, and I just saw today a group of uh, US NGOs have written uh, to the Biden administration asking for the US to commit $8 billion for climate change support. Uh, part of that being $4 billion or $3 billion that they, they didn't provide, uh, which Obama had promised and uh, Trump uh, did not uh, fulfill or uh, uh, go forward with. So there's a, a, a bit that they have to recover and then another uh, uh, $4 billion for uh, 2021. So uh, let us see whether Biden and the US administration will be able to cough up uh, or commit to that level of funding or not. Uh, the other uh, in interesting development is we now have a race to zero on the emissions front. We also have a race to resilience on the resilience front, uh, a championed by the two champions, uh, uh, Gonzalo Munoz from uh, uh, 
Chile and Nigel Topping from the UK from COP25 and COP26, respectively, galvanizing civil society activities, non-governmental actors taking actions, and we hope we can uh, contribute to that. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, uh, just had the Climate Adaptation Summit, which again was supposed to have been an in-person summit turned into a virtual summit going around the world. And uh, uh, in Bangladesh, we held the anchor event on locally led adaptation uh, on the 26th of January. And just prior to that, my center also ran a seven day long 24 seven uh, uh, Gobeshana conference on locally led adaptation, and which was uh, tremendous support and participation from all over the world. So things are moving in the right direction have a lot to achieve and go forward and, and get done. Uh, we don't have time to waste. And so we are very much looking forward to hearing from our uh, participants on what they will be able to uh, contribute. And the two exam questions that we have set for everybody is firstly, what are outcomes are needed for adaptation and resilience in particular to enhance global action uh, on adaptation and resilience in 20, COP26, but also broader than COP26. And then the second question uh, for each participant and panelist is, how can I or my organization contribute to uh, these uh, uh, ambitions uh, that uh, I have mentioned? So I'm going to now uh, introduce the six panelists and my co-discussant, uh, and uh, then we will go into the first round of uh, discussions with them. Uh, the first uh, um, person that I'd like to introduce is Thinli Choden, is a social entrepreneur and consultant from Bhutan. She possesses an extremely impressive portfolio working on climate change and sustainability issues encompassing entrepreneurial leadership solutions building, impact investing, green economy and climate governance. She is a climate reality leader and founder of the curator for global shapers Tim Puhab in Bhutan. Uh, today, Thinley is rep a representative of the LDC, Least Developed Countries Youth, and she, and we really look forward to hearing her ideas on what tangible outcomes and actions we need to see. So Thinley, thank you. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Next, we will hear from uh, Sheila Patel, who is the founder and director of the Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers, or SPARC in India. Sheila is a very good friend of mine and a highly and widely regarded activist. Uh, and academic working to support community organizations of the urban poor around the world. Uh, she has a huge uh, footprint in cities in Asia, Africa, Latin America. Sheila is a champion for locally led adaptation and uh, she is also a member of the Global Commission on Adaptation. And then the third uh, member who will be speaking in the first round, I'm very pleased to introduce my very good friend, Gebru Jemba Endalu who is currently technical lead of the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, uh, known as LIFE AR. He also serves as the regional lead at the Green Global Green Growth Institute for Africa, based in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and is the former chair of the Least Developed Countries Group in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So Gabriel, we're very pleased that you could join us and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I'll, I'll uh, quickly introduce the other three speakers now uh, and then invite uh, uh, my colleague Ve uh, Vel from FCDO to make a few opening remarks and then we'll go to the first set of three speakers. Uh, so the second set of speakers are uh, Tom Mitchell, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Climate Kick. Uh, Tom is bringing his expertise from 15 years working on climate resilience and climate change policy and research uh, to the discussion in previous roles. Tom led the climate change team at the Overseas Development Institute in the UK, also supported UN policy on disaster risk reduction and served as a coordinating lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and then we also have uh, Claire Shakya who today, who is the director of IID's Climate Change Research Group. Uh, Claire has over 25 years of experience in development in climate, energy and natural resources. She supports the least developed countries group in the uh, UNFCC negotiations, and she helped develop the Life AR initiative that Gebru is now uh, leading. Uh, she has, she'll be exploring deep institutional mechanisms that can support resilient development at country scale. Uh, Claire, myself, and Sheila are some of the co-authors of the newly launched 
principles for locally led adaptation. And I hope we have a chance to hear about that from her a little later as well. Uh, next and, and last of the panelists is going to complete the panel will be uh, Mr. Mike Barry, a well-known change agent and leader in sustainable business. Mike has worked with uh, many organizations such as Unilever, the Environment Agency, British Retail Consortium, GSK, and Climate Action, to name a few, and is a former director of sustainable business at Marks & Spencers. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Mike, and we hope to get a, a business perspective uh, from you as well. Uh, and, and lastly, but not least, let me uh, also introduce my co-host uh, for this uh, event is Vel Ganandran. Vel has spent 20 years working on international policy and is currently climate and environment director for the Co Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, FCDO, previously known as DFID to most of us. Uh, Vel is responsible for the UK government's uh, international support to climate and environmental issues uh, including on adaptation and resilience. And Avel is going to kick us off with a few introductory remarks. And later he and I will tag team on the uh, discussions with the two, two sets of three panelists that we will have over the next few uh, uh, hour or so. Avel, uh, would you like to share some uh, preliminary thoughts? Thank you, Salim, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you joining us. First, Salim, let me say thank you to you and to IIED for hosting this event. It's really timely and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. And, and that's because COP, uh, adaptation is a top priority for COP26. So I wanted to do two things. First, talk briefly about the approach, building on some of your comments, Salim, but then answer one of the questions around what does success look like from my perspective. So. Um, Firstly, on approach, at the Climate Ambition Summit, the, the, the summit that happened in December last year to mark five years on from, from the Paris Agreement, we had over 75 countries came. We had a lot of good commitments there, uh, a few on national adaptation plans, but actually most of the commitments there were around mitigation, long-term strategies and NDCs. So going into 2021, the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, adaptation and to a degree climate finance, as you mentioned, Salim, is going to be a big priority for, for the UK. Um, and I think, as you said, we've made a good start. Two weeks ago, we had the Gobeshina and we had the Climate Adaptation Summit. We had a huge number of world leaders there making commitments in a way certainly I've, I've never seen on adaptation. And then a number of us endorsed the locally led principles and, and the UK launched a, an adapt, with others an adaptation action coalition to try and drive sector level progress. So, so I think we've made a, a good start, but we need to, as you've said, sustain that momentum through, through the year, all the way up to COP26 and beyond. So just a couple of points on that. Firstly, we will be hosting a climate and development ministerial meeting in the coming, coming months. And our intention with that meeting is really to try and identify concrete actions that can be taken to support uh, developing and vulnerable countries, not only in dealing with the impacts of climate change, but recovering the development ground we've lost as a result of, of COVID and, and sort of recognizing that a lot of these crises are now compounding each other and increasing the level of challenge. So we want to use that ministerial to try and identify concrete actions to take there. We are also uh, the presidency of the G7 now, so I can, I can say that adaptation uh, is gonna be a key priority of our G7 presidency and as well as all of the other international processes that we are a part of uh, in 2021. So that's just a bit about approach. I really just want to emphasize how important this is for us going, going into 2021. Um, so what does success look like? I was just gonna make five points from my perspective, uh, Salim, if I may. First, I'll, I'll start by caveating this, say, saying I'm an optimist and I'm ambitious for this agenda. So I am setting a kind of high bar for, for what success looks like. Um, first, I think we have to recognize this is all country led. So um, from my perspective, I hope we will be able to see more ambition and more action in national efforts. And I wanna call out two specific points there that I think are really important. The first is being able to link national efforts to climate risk in a better way. I think countries need to be thinking now about what a 1.5 degree world will mean for them. And second, I think that planning needs to be mainstreamed into national processes. So not just a tick box exercise, and certainly not just something that's kept on a shelf in an environment ministry. So, so the first thing, what does success look like? Sort of, I would say much more ambitious, action-driven national planning. Second is that is financing, as you've said, Salim, is absolutely critical. Um, 
uh, the OECD released a report last November, it said about 20% of climate finance work went to uh, adaptation. And Salim, as you have said, even within that 20%, a much smaller amount reaches local levels. So success for me is a step change in the level of adaptation finance and ensuring that more of that reaches local levels. Third is, is uh, seeing, is, is taking adaptation solutions to scale. So the question I'm sort of asking myself is what are the solar panel and wind turbine equivalents in adaptation? What are the top technologies we need, for example, on too much or too little water? If they're out there already, how do we get them to scale? If they're not out there, how do we accelerate the innovation to get them, get them, make them available? Um, and I think part of the answer there is also recognizing that adaptation is a global challenge because I think with a global marketplace, you get a stronger pathway to scale for some of those um, uh, solutions. So uh, that's third. And then the fourth is, is the, you know, is the global goal on adaptation. So this is part of the Paris Agreement. And we absolutely need to make progress on that. And I, I want to nest that in a, in a wider effort that we need to make to raise the profile of adaptation so that it's not just a, an afterthought, but it's right up there with mitigation. When we think about climate action, we don't just think about mitigation, we think about adaptation too. And then the last, my kind of fifth, uh, I guess, uh, what does success look like? My fifth point there is recognizing that there will be some climate impacts for which no amount of adaptation will suffice. And this is the issue of, of loss and damage. And this is a challenging issue in the UNFCCC context, but we absolutely need to make progress in terms of answering some of the questions around how we avoid and how we minimize um, and address loss and damage. So what I guess I hope for is when you add all of that uh, together, Salim, that in 2021, it becomes the sort of the game changer year in terms of how we protect people, how we protect livelihoods, how we protect the planet from all of those climate impacts. So, so as I said, it's a high ambition set of goals for, for the coming year, but I think that's right. And we need to kind of fix a historic imbalance between adaptation and the rest of uh, climate action. And I hope we can do a lot of that this year. So I'll, I'll stop there, Salim, and back to you. Great, thank you very much, Val, for kicking us off. And, and I like your ambition. So let us see if we can make it all happen. Um, so now I'm going to move to the first round of our uh, three uh, speakers in order first with Tindley, then with Sheila, then with Gebru, and ask each of them within three minutes, if you can, uh, to uh, share your own uh, quick um, top line outcome expectation, and then what you yourself uh, are planning to do to help that. And then we will have plenty of time for <coughs> uh, a give and take discussion so that we can try and have this more as a conversation rather than long uh, presentations from uh, each person. I think that will be much more uh, engaging. So Tinli, uh, what are your uh, uh, expectations and, and your own plans to do things? Uh, thank you, Salim. Well, it gives me a great pleasure and immense honor to be speaking on behalf of the young people of the LDC group. Young people are the future and we need to hand over a better world to them. These are sentiments that we hear often expressed um, on the international forums and by governments. And I think the young are grateful for that. But what we need is actions in binding compliances, funding true collaboration across sectors and countries as we run up to COP26. Young people are one of the main stakeholders in this collective global action towards climate adaptation. But young people are not homogenous. More importantly, the place we come from and situated highly influence our voice, agency, and contribution towards solution building and actions. While there are a growing number of youth climate initiatives that are supported and brought into the fold by the respective governments or international organizations, we hardly see any representation of LDC youth. We celebrate all youth groups, initiatives, and platforms. It is so inspiring and confidence building to see so many countries being inclusive of their of the voices of their young people. However, as a representative of the LDC youth, I have to speak truth to power. Please integrate LDC youth when you speak of equity, inclusivity, and diversity. Young people of LDC would like to see ourselves represented, heard, and contributing. In this effort, I would like to pitch two areas of urgent climate action and outcomes through the COP26 process to empower LDC youth. First, youth leadership and decision-making. The deafening silence of young people in the decision-making uh, and solution process are even louder in the LDC group. Globally today, young people's voices and agency and energy are largely relegated to advocacy roles, which 
some may argue is already too late in providing meaningful input and action because young people are either working to amplify or change decisions that were made on their behalf in their absence. We want to see LDC youth councillor groups established at national and international platforms that is empowered as a stakeholder, not just for tokenism. The second, the young uh, social entrepreneurship, the young are in the front line of disrupting systems to find solutions. Social entrepreneurship and innovations are largely youth driven. We want impact fund accelerator and mentoring programs targeted at social climate entrepreneurs. So we call on the self integrity of the LDC governments, powerful governments, international bodies and businesses for action oriented moral and responsible leadership to make this happen. We're not asking for charity, we're asking you to invest in us. We ask you to work with us for a youth inclusive adaptation for our world. So what am I doing here in Bhutan? Um, in addition to being a youth ally and advocate, I'm a climate reality leader, founding curator of Global Shapers Kimpu Hub, and an entrepreneur ecosystem enabler. We hold a lot of dialogues on climate change and climate education, building our narrative and call for action. I also work with entrepreneurs for nature positive startups. But we do, we do this largely in a vacuum with no real collaboration and investments for growth scale and large impact. Hence, we are largely able to, we, we are only able to take a step or two when we could be making leaps and bounds. So if young are the future, let us work together for that future. Thank you. So that's my three minutes. Great. Thank you very much, Tinley. That was excellent. So just a quick comment. I can't resist. I think one of the things that the youth need to be thinking of and doing is stop asking and start telling. Tell your leaders what you want. Don't ask. Don't wait to ask them. Don't wait for them. You have to tell them what you want them to do and make them do it. Uh, let me now move on to uh, Sheila. Sheila, would you like to share your preliminary thoughts? Thank you. And Tinley, great power to you. <laughs> uh, we all support you and we want to work with you. And like um, Salim said, don't ask, demand. I think that is what I want to start off with, that COP26 has to be a process that is truly inclusive of transformation. For too long, all this closed door business, we are only governments, those kind of talks have not led to the kind of transformation that we require for the climate change and this decade to work. And so as new entrants, as you know, I come from a social movement of the urban poor, we find that uh, the issues of the urban poverty groups, the challenges that urban and rural and all forms of seriously vulnerable communities has been completely, completely uh, just invisible. And so my demand, which I think comes out of the fact that finally adaptation is no longer the Cinderella, and we found the nice shoes for her is that we are going to demand that, uh, I think we have to create voices and expectations to our governments, to the negotiators, that we must look at transformation in its complete sense. And that means adaptation, that is a choice that every person makes to make the world work for the most vulnerable, but also for the planet. And I think, that conversation has to invade all the spaces. That's my first expectation. My other very important uh, insight is that mitigation and adaptation have to be two sides of the same coin and treated equally. Because a lot of mitigation produces crisis for the very vulnerable. And therefore, Adaptation has to be seen as part of that process and has to be financed, designed, technology involvement. All those things have to be very much there. And finally, I believe that uh, social movements, uh, networks, large networks of very vulnerable communities have finally found voice space in the last one and a half year when COVID destroyed the vertical architecture of development and transform the way we look at crisis pandemics. And therefore, when I look at what we contribute, we as SDI, we are a social movement. We work in three to 400 cities. We want to demonstrate strong local partnerships 
between universities, communities, and local authorities, because real adaptation is deeply local. And we want at COP a global commitment to support local transformation because the many locals has to be the new global. The second thing I want to say is that whether we are talking about youth, we are talking about gender, like Tin Lee said, poor people are treated as beneficiaries and social movements are telling you very clearly that there is no such thing as consumers and beneficiaries anymore. We are all to be partners. And therefore, the transformation we are looking for is a seat at the table from design to execution to counting the outcomes. And we are there and we will make the noise that's necessary with all those whose voices have been absent in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. We hope that will happen. So um, and let me now invite Gebru uh, to share your uh, preliminary thoughts. Gebru. Uh, thank you, Selim. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I think much has been said by the previous speakers, but I would like to highlight a few things. Uh, first, I, I do believe that this is almost the COP where we are going to move from a series of negotiation for a number of decades into an implementation phase. So I do expect this COP to really focus more on action than actual negotiation. So I know some technical issues need to be addressed, but we need to really strongly focus on how we can achieve results on the ground. And one key message which I would like to highlight is we need to respond to the call from science rather than looking at each other. So everyone needs to, because we have already realized that no one is immune from the impacts of climate change and variability. So everyone needs to be engaged in addressing uh, the key asks from the uh, scientific community. And the other message which I want to send is we need to think, plan, and implement in a business unusual way because we have been doing things in a projectized sector specific or area limited action on the ground, which is not really bringing in significant impact on the ground. So we need to move out of this business as usual way of implementing, which has resulted in having a number of intermediaries in between and not more than 15% of resources reaching to the most vulnerable communities. So the business unusual way of uh, planning up to implementation across the value chain needs to start from now. Uh, and in terms of engaging uh, stakeholders, I think we need to bring in everyone, including the private sector. Because like, uh, unless we bring in the private sector to build its own economy, as well as, well as contribute to the, uh, the specific community where uh, the specific private sector is there, uh, which is very crucial. So. Uh, during this scope, I, I don't think that will answer all the uh, outstanding questions, but I do hope that more countries will bring in their 2050 vision with a net zero as well as uh, a resilient economy to be uh, in place across uh, the world. So we expect more ambitious NDC as well as 2050 vision to be uh, presented during this COP. Thank you. And at the same time, this COP, I do expect a number of best practices and lessons to be shared uh, during this COP. And finally, of course, as Salimo, you already mentioned, uh, uh, the, the way to measure adaptation to set a goal is indirectly through setting financial goal. Mm -hmm. So I do expect the global community to respond to the uh, the need, the enablers, including finance, uh, during the scope. Thank Let me you. stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. We are running a little bit uh, uh, behind time, but I still want to go back to you uh, with an, uh, one more question, uh, and then I'll invite uh, Vel to come in and uh, share some of his thoughts. So, um, thank you very much, all three of you, for your. Uh, contributions. I think we are off to a very good start. I'd like to go back to you first, to get, first uh, Thinley and then Sheila and then Gabriel for some quick uh, reflections, if you don't mind. Uh, particularly, not so much what the what the COP should be doing, but what we can do to use the COP to get us to do more together. And so, how can we benefit from 
being able to participate in the COP and then bring our networks together, the youth network, the slum dwellers network, the life AR uh, initiatives in the seven front runner countries. How can we get some of us together, working together, go to the COP, tell them about it, but then come back from the COP with energy and support to do more on the ground? Because to me, that is really the outcome that we want. You know, a decision in the COP really is not an outcome. It's just a, a piece of paper. Uh, but we, if we can actually make things happen, uh, I would uh, like you to reflect on that. What would you like to see us doing together after the COP, at the COP and then after the COP? If Briefly, if you don't mind. Thinly, I'll start with you. I think for the young people, you know, especially talking from LDC, uh, LDCU's perspective, I think in terms of what's happening in our respective countries, I'm pretty confident there are a lot of things happening, but it's very scattered, it's very individual and it's very isolated. And the, the power of self-organizing or the power of a quote unquote un, un, unionizing to have a bigger presence and have a bigger voice. I think that is the uh, platform needed for young people from the LDC group, especially when, when we talk about our international platform like COP26. Because the reality is, regardless of who you are, if you don't know, you don't know. If you're not heard, you're not heard. So the fact of having a presence at the international level is important for our voices to be heard. But at the, uh, in terms of implementation and action at the ground or in our respective communities and countries, I think, you know, first of all, I think our respective governments need to not only say young people and that they, we are the future, like I said earlier, I think a lot of us in the LDC group are kind of quote unquote, kind of fed up with hearing that and want to see the government actually put actions to their word and then give us the power, give us the platform because together we can actually, we can make a larger impact than doing it all at a very one-off uh, uh, you know, initiatives here and there. So the power of organizing and then bringing action together. Thank you, Tinli. Uh, Sheila, and there's also a question for you, Sheila, which is, um, how can the informal groups that you work with become formal so that they can be recognized? Uh, because as you know, informality is more difficult to recognize. Sheila? So first of all, welcome to the new normal. Mm -hmm. COVID made everything informal. So mm -hmm. welcome to informality <laughs> and you all Correct. better get used to it, that's one. The second thing is that, uh, social movements of the urban poor represented by shack dwellers in for international represent the, the, the layer of uh, intermediation between formality and informality uh, in which we exist. And you will see this occurring in all the different social movements. And I think that this is the time where, to answer your question, Salim, uh, the last two years, if you look at the relationship that uh, social movements, IIED, the GCA's locally led action track, uh, uh, all the organizations that have put together the principles that, you, that Claire will be talking about, we're trying to transform this top-down vertical process into something that is circular. Uh, which, which transforms roles and relationships, not only between governments and power holders and people who are considered victims, beneficiaries, consumers, into stakeholders with different roles and different functions. And finally, and most importantly, uh, we have to recognize, you know, you talk, uh, Dindy talks about youth. The youth in informal settlements are the complete voiceless people. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, one of the things that we are doing, which I will be attending after I finish this meeting, is a network of youth leaders from informal settlements from 15 countries who run a campaign called Know Your City. If you go on the net, uh, you will see the videos that they have made of their settlement, transforming their own imageries, their imageries of their informal settlements, and transforming the roles. And we call them our fifth generation. They are the people that we want to see populate the voices uh, in, in, in all the structures. We're going to invade all the structures. The question is, it's got to be an invasion that is celebrated or an invasion mm -hmm. that is seen in this hostility invasion mm -hmm. or by invitation. So 
We're already doing right. that. And I think it starts with the coalition of the trust that groups Excellent. that work together. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sheila. So uh, uh, let me move to Gebru. Gebru, uh, now that you are no longer uh, LDC chair negotiating, but you're now in the practical uh, implementation phase of adaptation resilience in some of the leading least developed countries who are taking a leading role, by the way, on this uh, issue. Uh, where do you see us taking this forward in a practical manner on the ground? Well, uh, I think that that's a critical challenge. What we have been trying to see is like the, uh, so far, actually, especially the least developed countries have been really good in implementing adaptation for the last number of years since NAPA was formulated. But when you look at uh, things happening on the ground, uh, it's not really making a significant impact. So based on the work, the, uh, the analysis that we have undertaken on 100 plus projects worldwide, especially focusing on least developed countries, uh, we need to really to change uh, across the value chain, how we are rethinking and implementing. So in that regard, uh, uh, of course, as well mentioned, it needs to be uh, actually mainstream. We need to move out of the sector specific way of planning and implementation. And that mainstreaming needs to happen. Besides, I do see that there is no clear boundary between adaptation, mitigation and development when it comes to least developed countries. Each has its own core benefits. So if we are able to integrate these three pillars together, I think will have more impact. Even from value for money perspective, bringing in major impact from the ground, uh, we need to really change our uh, thinking from the beginning, how we are planning and how we are engaging the communities on the ground. Is top-down uh, planning works? No, it's not working. How we can bring in the communities? How can we make them able to access the resources so that they manage it and then they prioritize and they integrate a kind of landscape approach of realizing uh, resilience on the ground. So it, we have already through life here, we are just starting how we can really bring in the communities to be the leaders for the, uh, building the resilience. Uh, I do expect during this COP, we'll be able to share our lessons in, the, in our journey for the last uh, few months. So. Uh, Excellent. A lot to be done, but we're just beginning. Thank you, Rizal. Excellent, Gabriel. So let me also take this opportunity to extend an invitation to all your work uh, next year in the Gobeshna Conference next January. I want to get all your community leaders in the front runner countries to come and participate and tell us what they're doing. Uh, so let me now uh, invite Vel to uh, share some reflections and then uh, we'll go to the next uh, round of panelists. And in the meantime, if people have questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. We'll try and address them uh, in the open uh, discussion session. Uh, and if not, then I'll ask uh, panelists to maybe just write in uh, responses to the ones that they feel uh, they can do that to. Well, please, uh, you want to just share some reflection on the first three that you heard? Th thanks, Salim, and, and thanks to Tinley, Sheila, and Gebru. Um, I, I, I know you're behind time, so let me just do two quick reflections. One, I, I very much take from sort of the Thinley uh, and Sheila conversation, this need to, to social movements, whether it's youth or, or, or whatever, to, to kind of break down some of those barriers between movements and policy making. And at the moment, it, you know, that, that you know, I, I definitely hear the point on demanding, and I think there's very lots of power in that. It helps push, pull government, you know, to a, to a more ambitious place. But we can also go further than that and think about breaking down some of those um, barriers. And I think success is pe perhaps also an element of how much progress we make on that. And then I really just wanted to pick up on Gebru's point about sort of change it, business unusual, I think is your phrase, isn't it, Gebru? Mm -hmm. How do we think about doing adaptation different? And actually, I, I really, the point Gebru finished on there, it's not just adaptation, it is the future of development. And we need to think about that differently and not just in developing countries, I think everywhere, it needs to be low carbon and climate resilient. And it is a different way of thinking about these things and sort of surfacing that and making progress on that journey to change our mindset and how we're thinking about that is also an important thing, um, a really important point to take away. Back to you, Sam. Great. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, so uh, thank you to our first round of uh, panelists and speakers. I would invite you to keep an eye on the chat box and Q&A 
And if you'd like to respond to any of the questions or comments there, please go ahead and type them in because uh, we may or may not have time to uh, do them orally uh, uh, during the session. Uh, so I'd like to now move on to our second set of three uh, panelists and speakers and start with uh, uh, Mike. Uh, Mike, you have a lot of experience in the in the private sector. What do you think the role of the private sector may be in the adaptation and resilience space? Mike? And, and thank you. And I appreciate I'm a little bit of a different voice here, uh, bringing a business perspective. And I want to say very humbly and early, one of the reasons we're having this conversation today is because business has polluted the planet. In terms of the emissions it's put out of the last 20, 30, 40 years, too little has been done too slowly. I'm going to focus on adaptation, but I want to just sort of mention very quickly that on mitigation, business is starting slowly to take this seriously. So I see more and more response from corporates now in terms of setting a net zero goal to reduce their scope one and two operational emissions and scope three supply chain and product use emissions as well. That's good. Too late, but, but it's good that we've seen the progress. Why is business not doing as much on adaptation? That is the homework question I'm going to answer over the next two minutes. And from a business perspective, it's complicated. So when I talk to business leaders about mitigation, that's my factory or farm or shop or office. I know what the carbon emissions are. I know what the need to be. I can come up with a plan to reduce them. When I talk to them about adaptation, it is much more complicated. So we have a drought in the, the Corn Belt in the United States. What implication does that have for a food retailer in Europe? It's very difficult to work out. What impact does flooding or drought have in African supply chains feeding a Western business? It's complicated to work out. So for all the work that's being done by business on climate change at the moment, more than 90% is on mitigation, less than 10% is on adaptation. And I just want to offer five brief bullet points about how to change that. The first is narrative. Whenever I sit down in business circles talking about climate change, it is mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. The World Business Council on Sustainable Development, Business for Social Responsibility have started the narrative with business to say, no, it's more than that. We have to adapt. We have to prepare for inevitable um, climate change. So we need more of that. The second thing we need to do is we need to use these new reporting um, structures that are coming in that are demanding that business report on the climate risk, TCFD, Task Force on climate related financial disclosure. It has to just not ask business about mitigation, but also about the adaptation risks that they face in their business and their, their value chains. The third thing we do need to do is we need to get business excited about the possibilities here. Now the word climate smart agriculture, there's lots to do with that, but I'm going to put it in the room as something tangible that can bring enormous benefits to people on the ground in Africa, better product production, better quality, better outcomes for everybody. And we need something like that that business can get behind and understand. My fourth thing is about the carbon markets. Business will be looking at net zero, what is the net offsetting, making sure that those carbon markets, voluntary money, goes to adaptation projects as well as mitigation. And my final point, you've already mentioned it, is the really important role about race to zero from COP26. And I'm delighted it's not just about mitigation now. There is an adaptation group as well working on this. So let me finish there. Five points about getting business more involved. Business has caused the problem. Business needs to be at the heart of solving the adaptation challenge as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. That's ex extremely useful. And I think, you know, one of the big challenges for us in the adaptation field has been engaging with business in a positive uh, uh, manner, which I think is beginning to happen, but we need to go a lot faster. Uh, let me now invite Tom uh, to share some of his thoughts. Tom, you've done a lot of work on innovation. Uh, do you want to share some of your uh, thinking on how that plays a role on the adaptation resilience front? Thank you, Salim. So I think I wanted to start by just acknowledging a set of reports that we've seen come out within the last month that point to some, I think, serious challenges for all of us to grapple with. So, so the first I'd want to highlight is, is the report um, that came from CARE that highlighted that quite a lot of the international adaptation spending uh, funding that we've been seeing has, has either not been arriving or has been fabricated. I think that's a serious problem that we've got to address. Secondly, we've got a, a really interesting assessment of the evidence on, on adaptation impact from a paper written by Siri Erickson and colleagues in World Development mm -hmm. that highlights that 
of the projects themselves are actually making the situation worse, not better. Mm. We've got a situation where the uh, adaptation gap report from UNEP is highlighting that there's almost no evidence of actual climate risk reduction. And so if you could kind of in some ways characterize it quite simply as the international adaptation system is broken, there's not enough money, it's not getting to where it needs to be, it's being spent on things that make the situation worse, and that there is very little evidence that we're improving anything. Now, I don't, it's, it's tough being quite so blunt about it, but if that's the, the kind of key messages from reports over the last few, few weeks, then I think there's a job to do in what, what Val says around the climate and development ministerial, I think that has to look at what the reform agenda is. Uh, the reform agenda that really says, here are a set of ways in which the international system is going to support the locally led adaptation we need, and what changes will, will need to be put in place to, to make that happen. But the point that I wanted to really raise was actually that waiting for the international system to reform in such a way that it really does create the enabling environment, it's going to take too long, is my judgment. And that the space that I think is opening up, and partly Mike is highlighting it too here, is that adaptation, I think there are more countries, more places realizing that Adaptation and resilience is also an economic growth strategy. It is a societal transformation strategy. It is one that needs to involve all voices and all partners, but that there is an opportunity for countries and places to gain a slice of the adaptation economy. Now that adaptation economy, both in terms of, of SMEs, of, of startups, of, of innovative companies, and the ability, of course, to then use those ideas and approaches locally, as well as generating value and jobs in a, in a COVID recovery approach uh, afterwards. We're starting to see that. And I think that's an important signal that business is taking it seriously, but that there are significant opportunities. I think the other component that I wanted to highlight around innovation is that we have, I think, uh, to some extent, been relying too heavily on an international technology-led innovation approach. You know, and, and that there's been a lot of work on tech transfer. There have been reports on the type of adaptation technologies needed to be diffused. To me, that is the wrong way around. I think there is two things to highlight. One is that there needs to be a domestic approach to adaptation innovation, which is about local leadership, local solutions for local problems, but also ones that can be scaled up. But secondly, it cannot just be technology. The approach that Climate Kick has been taking is very much looking at transformative adaptation from the perspective of bringing new ideas simultaneously to technology, but to policy, to regulation, to incentive systems, to business models, to citizen engagement, to, to ways of working, to innovative finance and so on, which we call deep demonstrations of, of resilient regions in Climate Kick's programs. And I think for me, that is a way in which we can bring together both the economic value of the adaptation agenda, the social value, and offer a kind of transformational approach. That takes leadership, though, leadership of, of local organizations, of governments, and that we're very much looking to work in partnership with those countries and those leaders who are saying, well, there is an opportunity now to seize the, the moment, um, do something good locally, but also start to build a new economic vision that has resilience and adaptation at its heart. Let me just also, in closing, mention two or three other initiatives that I think it would be worth us paying attention to. So I work for an organization called Climate Kick, as Salim has talked about. Not everybody will know that organization. It is being born out of, of Europe and the European Commission as Europe's innovation hub, essentially, for tackling climate change. Now, what the European Commission has done recently, of course, around the Green Deal, I think has been has been well publicized but also within that there is something called missions and missions uh, are about setting very bold targets societal targets for 2030. One of those five missions set by the commission is on adaptation and societal transformation that is has been shared and has been launched alongside a new EU adaptation strategy that is due for for launch also on the 24th of February. I would encourage those here and, and participating in this webinar to have a look at those documents. The reason I say that is because I think it is probably 
the boldest vision for adaptation and transformation set out anywhere on that kind of scale with the type of funding behind it. And it involves working with many different vulnerable regions, albeit in European space, on a transformational adaptation approach. What I'll do is I will put the links to these documents in, in the window here yeah. um, that you can, you can look at and, and consider. Um, and we'll also share uh, a note about some of the efforts that are going on now to, to, to seize essentially an innovation-led approach to transformational adaptation uh, at a local level that I would very much encourage anybody interested in that more to, to be in touch and to see how Climate Kit can, can participate and to join together with you. But thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, Celine. Great, thank you very much, Tom, for that excellent uh, intervention and also the advice on how to promote bottom-up innovation uh, rather than top-down uh, innovations as well. Um, uh, let me now invite uh, uh, Claire uh, Shakya from IID to share some of uh, her thoughts and particularly perhaps also uh, tell us a little bit more about the locally led adaptation principles and, and what's happening with them. Claire? Thanks, Salim. Um, the advantage of coming last is I can hopefully shorten what I wanted to say just by <laughs> referencing other people. <laughs> but um, I think in the in trying to frame adaptation success, we've spent far too long saying what adaptation, what is adaptation versus other things like development. And actually what we should be asking is how do we deliver the transformation in societies that are needed to thrive in the face of climate change? So as Gebru's mentioned, the LDC 2050 vision sets out this aim of their societies, economies, and ecosystems thriving. Um, the, the issue is that vulnerability is not purely physical, um, but it's equally about power and politics and the compounding drivers of vulnerability that poor communities face. So we can't just pick the issues one by one. We have to look for opportunities to be disruptive of the system as a whole and develop a vision that engages the whole of society. It's, so it's a shared opportunity for the very poorest as well as the power holders a more equitable distribution of risks, but also opportunities. So um, what delivers transformation in societies? Well, we, we, as others have mentioned, these principles for locally led adaptation have been looking at when we've seen investments that are more transformative, what were the magic ingredients? What were the common areas across all of the different uh, successes? Um, and just to mention three, um, one was flexible support that reaches down to the local level behind local priorities. It has to, adaptation has to be context specific to tackle those underlying drivers of vulnerability and the power can't stay with just the funder. It has to be distributed. So it's with those that are in the delivery of a locally driven process um, who know their context, know their priorities. And people say, oh, they just focus on immediate needs. Well, maybe in the first year, but over time, you begin to see these communities address really strategic change. The second is around social justice. We need to be tackling the um, structural uh, um, uh, ways that people are excluded to bring together that broad range of perspectives that Tinley and Sheila and, and um, Gebru have referenced. Um, we need that because otherwise we can't identify the synergies and resolve those trade-offs that might be temporal, spatial, or around social distribution. Uh, we need to give authority uh, to different community members, to different types of leaders, to begin to create the, um, the shared space where um, young people, women, children, indigenous peoples, um, those living with dis disabilities or even those displaced can actually start to engage in that whole of society vision. And finally, around partnerships, we need long term deliberative partnerships. This isn't about coming up with a brilliant idea and then sitting back and hoping someone's going to deliver it. We have to adjust with our learning. We have to look for those unintended consequences that the um, Siri Erickson paper outlines so beautifully. And um, that requires us to begin to develop shared risk, but also shared, shared vision, shared monitoring shared objectives across all the different stakeholders from the community up and so the challenge within the adaptation unf triple c process is we have to be aware of the incentive set by metrics if we can't have a neutral top-down technical process that sets out what adaptation is we need the global goal the global stock take to capture that diversity of context and people's lived experience of vulnerability but also their aspirations of how they want to wish, uh, how they wish to adapt and thrive. 
So we've mentioned, I mean, we're working with Life AR, we're working with the social movements on frontline funds to help them formalize their leadership. And we're working on these principles of sort of 42, 43, I think now, as of yesterday, um, organizations, governments, um, social movements, NGOs that have signed up to work together um, under this 10 year journey of, of learning what it is that helps the transformation of societies that we will need to thrive in the future. Great, thank you very much, Claire. Thank you, all three of you. Uh, so I'll I'll do uh, the same as I did last uh, round of panelists. I'll go back to each of you with a a practical what next question in the same order, Mike, uh, Tom, and Claire, uh, and then I'll invite Val to uh, share some of his reflections. And then I hope we'll have time for taking some questions from the audience. We've been receiving quite a few of them. Uh, and uh, I'd invite uh, the panelists to keep an eye on the chat box. And if there's something in particular you'd like to respond to, uh, please uh, go ahead and do that when we come to the Q&A session. Uh, so the question, Mike, is practically, you, you are in this game now, what do you suggest we do <clears throat> joining forces? We've got you know six very different uh, interlocutors with different sectors. Uh, talking uh, to each other here is something practical that we might be able to uh, take forward after this uh, session is over mike yes and the most efficient way to do it is with the race to zero so race to zero has built really good momentum and coalitions of businesses to work on mitigation mm -hmm. so many big industrial sectors and steel cement retail are stepping forward and saying together we want to reduce our emissions towards net zero We've now got this parallel track around adaptation as, mm -hmm. as of January. At the moment, in the minds of most business people, they're separate. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is work with Nigel and the team to bring them together, yeah, together. Mm -hmm. so that we solve mitigation and resilience together from the beginning. That's the number one and perhaps the only thing that we need to focus on in the next 10 months in the road to COP26. Excellent, Mike. And, and we'll, we'll call on your advice and expertise in... in trying to do that of course. Um, tom uh what what next steps practically you you mentioned the european initiative is that just europe or are they, are they going to talk to the rest of the world good question salim actually i spoke <laughs> to the <laughs> and uh and that they wanted to reiterate that their focus was predominantly on europe at this stage i did point <laughs> out that actually there's a huge amount to learn from other parts of the world and they should be humble um, let's hope that that, uh, that message lands. Um, what I would say, though, is that the, the structure that they have put together for both the mission and the strategy is, uh, I think, has learned from other parts of the world. Salim, you've been part of some of those debates and, and sessions, and that they also wanted to reiterate to me how impactful that that had been uh, on the way that this has developed. But I think what practically that that, that does highlight um, is that Yes, it's important, of course, to have adaptation be locally led, um, but also we need to acknowledge that there are incentives and subsidies and regimes in the different scales that make locally led adaptation really difficult. And if we don't work across those scales in a way that, as Claire said, really puts the, the kind of transformative quality at the heart of that work, then we're not going to be able to achieve all that we need to achieve. And so the practical work that Climate Kick is trying to do is to work across those scales in tandem with all the different stakeholders, ensuring it's locally led, but to also highlight where there are those barriers. Uh, and we cannot underestimate those. And I think the type of assessment that we've had from the, the World Development article, that there are still many things that are causing maladaptation, uh, we cannot shy away from. And I think we've got to tackle those just as much too. And business needs to be part of that. Business is part and parcel of that overall system. And we need to create frameworks that bring business, civil society, communities, and others together. I think one, one other point that I want to raise is that our international financing system for adaptation, including through the international uh, mechanisms, is still too bureaucratic, too slow, too driven by accountability and by concerns about misappropriation of funding. And as Claire said, create a set of of incentives around uh, the measurement structure of that, the monitoring, evaluation, and learning structures, and so on, the milestones that are actually causing part of the problem. And I think we need to challenge 
the way in which we're uh, building accountability frameworks around this funding structure and shortening the timeframes and so on. And there is an opportunity to do that through COP. Now, that's not the solution in and of itself to all of our ills, but it's an important part of the puzzle that is certainly not helping right now. Great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Claire, uh, what are IID plans going forward? Um, well, we'll continue to work with the LDC group on their um, Life AR initiative, which really is trying to grapple with these issues on trying to understand what business unusual practically really looks like. Um, equally, I think the opportunity with the with the um, social movements to, um, to to begin to position them um, as core partners to the process so that it's not just a dialogue around what governments could do, but how governments work with those social movements that can organize communities and bring that collective voice up to the national level to begin to tackle the sort of policy changes that, that Tom was talking about. Um, but the, 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 the opportunity, I think, under uh, the principles for locally led adaptation is begin to continue to grow the, those organizations that have signed up um, we've only got a couple of businesses there, Mike, so maybe we need to work with you on looking at how this could be applied to a business context. Um, but the, 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 the principles around locally led adaptation are not to say everything has to happen at that local level. What we're saying is we need to see much more of that vertical integration between the different levels and, and really put more effort into resolving the participation asymmetry in developing the new vision, the developing how society, that, that understanding of how societies need to transform that brings those community voices and that that community is not homogenous, it's very heterogeneous. So all of those different groups need to be understood to have different perspectives and those perspectives brought together. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, I'm delighted we're working with you, Salim. It's a 10 year journey. It's gonna take us a while to fix, but the, the um, I think the opportunities are very, very, real this year to try and to try and bring that story through. Great, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, Vel, over to you for some uh, reflections. Thanks, Salim. And again, what, what a great set of speakers and a great conversation. I mean, just two, two quick reflections. One, a, a little anecdote to pick up on, on what Mike was saying about the sort of bringing uh, sort of adaptation and mitigation together in the private sector space. So Emma Howard Boyd, who some of you will know, she is the chair of the UK's Environment Agency uh, and was on the Global Commission for Adaptation. She told me uh, a, a few weeks ago about an example she had seen of an electric vehicle charging point, uh, which is obviously a part of our emissions reduction strategy that was flooded because uh, it was in a zone where, you know, which was on a floodplain. So the, the fact that these issues will all converge together, I think is, I just wanted to share that anecdote because I think it's a very visual example of what Mike was talking about. Um, uh, the, the only other thing I wanted to pick up on was this sort of, this sort of discussion we're having around top down and bottom up and, you know, what, 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 what approach should we be taking? And I think, I mean, I'm sure we all agree with this, but I just thought it's worth sort of outing it, which is that we need both, right? I think Mark, Tom's point, we need to change the system because I agree there are some real deep problems with the way we do this in the system. But at the same time, we can't just exclusively focus on the international system. We also need to kind of be thinking about, you know, what, what solution is needed in each geography? Uh, how does that become part of a, a sort of a, an integrated planning process where funds can flow at the national level down and that that's a two-way process with sort of learning from the front line feeding back into the planning. So I, I think it, I just wanted to kind of make one reflection that I think we need to do both of those things, um, the sort of the top down and the bottom up and both of them need strengthening. But great conversation. Thanks, Aline, back to you. Great, thank you very much, Vel. So uh, we have a few minutes left for some uh, uh, open Q&A and we've got quite a few questions in the Q&A box and also discussions in the chat box, which I'm glad to see people are responding to. Uh, but uh, let me uh, invite each of our speakers maybe to uh, take one or two questions. Uh, I'll start with Thinley uh, uh, from the first panel. The question is, you, uh, you mentioned your work on nature positive. Around the world, youth have mobilized around both the climate and nature crises calling for stronger action from decision makers on practical action to address both climate change and the unprecedented loss of nature. Uh, in this context, what do you think is the most important thing uh, for COP26 and also COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention as well? Uh, Thinley, would you like to uh, um, share some thoughts on that? 
Sure. <clears throat> I think first and foremost, if you don't have the earth, we don't have our existence, right? Absolutely. We, we need to protect the earth. And if everyone is worried about the future, what the life, what, what would life be in the future? We have to think it from the nature's perspective because nature sustains us. It helps us with, uh, with evolution. It helps us with adaptation. And there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the nature. So when I was talking about the nature positive businesses, you know, nature is, can also be looked upon as a business opportunity without sounding very um, negative or with, without having the negative connotation, but using what's there and being innovative and being entrepreneurial on that. And some of the business that, that I support here is I work with young entrepreneurs who use uh, wellness, who are making wellness products from natural resources or natural ingredients that are sourced from the forest, working with community forests and farmer groups. So these are just examples of how you can sustainably use nature for um, entrepreneurship or livelihood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Bhutan is always the great example for all countries on how do you uh, live in, in harmony with nature. I think uh, 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 something that the rest of the world can learn from Bhutan on. Uh, thank you, Timpu. So let me move on to Sheila. There's a question to Sheila uh, that uh, at the grassroots level, working with the vulnerable groups, particularly in the slums that you do, is there an opportunity to link adaptation and mitigation or is it just uh, looking at adaptation? Sheila? Uh, I think you remember that when I started talking, I said that mitigation and adaptation are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that every time there is an investment in cities, on a mitigation project, it produces huge dislocation, it produces evictions, and it produces lots of problems for the very poor. Uh, be that the laying of uh, good quality public transport or transforming your energy system, uh, it affects this. And the point is, uh, our role is to look at how do we negotiate for a win-win solution that works for the communities that may be displaced to reduce the displacement or to make it a positive value-added relocation that works for them and do it in a way that not only solves the problem of this project right now, but produces policies and investment strategies and is demonstrated to have actually a better economic outcome than, uh, you know, than, than having to face uh, uh, aggression and arguments and court cases which delay projects. So I think it's it's important to it's it's important to to look at the multiple dimensions of any development investment that is made, and to look at it locally and globally. And if I might take one more moment, mm -hmm. uh, I was very interested in this discussion between private sector and these issues. Uh, I just want to give a, a small example. There's a law in the EU that's, that holds uh, multinational organizations to be responsible for the waste that is produced out of packaging. And we have a network of waste pickers in Cairo who have done a deal with these major global private sector multinational companies where they, they get resources to segregate the waste and to utilize them. And that becomes not a subsidy, but the fulfillment of their regulatory requirements. So you have a very local grassroots movement of waste pickers in one city that is demonstrating how you can do a negotiation with a global multinational, which today can easily be multiplied in another 50 cities mm -hmm. and another mm -hmm. 100. Uh, how the, you know, so the question is, how do we pick these innovations? And how do we standardize them? And we can only do that if there is a real commitment to partnerships between really unusual uh, stakeholders. Partners, absolutely. Great, thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, uh, Gabriel, let me ask you a question uh, about, especially building on this, how do we, how do we, or how do you plan to share lessons across the different least developed countries which are now part of the, Life AR uh, initiative that you are uh, heading. 
you know, every country is going to be doing their own things, but there's a lot of knowledge sharing that can be done across the countries as well, not just with the seven front runner countries, but with all the least developed countries. So have you given some thought on how that will be done? Well, uh, we are planning to have this lesson learning because the initiative, if you go country by country, will take years. We are going to start with seven countries. But in the meantime, we are going to uh, arrange lesson learning within the country, as well as within a given region where the front running countries, uh, front -running countries are there, and to the wider LDC group or developing countries perspective. So in that regard, just I would like to share that, I mean, one of the, in our initiative is LAC, which we want to make use of LAC. Uh, I'm happy that it was launched during my chairmanship as well. Uh, we are going to make use of LAC, a network of LDC universities to be part of the solution because we feel that capacity building is not the solution. We need to have capacity development. So mm -hmm. part of that capacity development is uh, making an enabling environment to the already existing universities and research centers within LDCs to be part of the solution. So we are going to make use of uh, every uh, actor in each front runner countries across the process. So in that case, so, uh, the lesson is to be shared at different states of implementation at national, regional, as well as a global level using different for us. Thank you. Excellent. So Thank you. So we look forward to collaborating with Life AR uh, Gebru from our LAC Universities Initiative. Um, let me come to Mike. Mike, there's a question for you uh, that asks, um, is innovation driving the adaptive business environment? Uh, is, is it possible for creating enabling environment uh, for businesses? Are they open to new ideas and new ways of working? Mike, what is your experience with the businesses you've been working with? I'll answer that question with a couple of more questions in the, in the chat, which is about the consumer. People are buying mitigation solutions when they buy things today. So when you decide not to have a diesel car, but an electric car, you shift from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, you, the individual, are buying a mitigation solution. At the moment, the market doesn't allow you, as a citizen, to buy an adaptation solution. Now, there's two pathways forward. One is carbon markets might increasingly allow individual people or corporations to buy adaptation solutions that bring value on the other side of the world. But I want to pick up on a point that Sheila made very, very powerfully about regulation. The UK has some of the most advanced climate policy in the world, a lot to be proud of, but it's only for our territorial carbon emissions that happen here. For the 40% of our emissions that happen in global supply chains for producing the things we consume in the UK, not covered. The British government has started to introduce laws, for example, on deforestation associated with soil, uh, so soya and palm oil, to demand that British businesses selling products here take responsibility for these emissions and the problems on the other side of the world. And I think there has to be a form of regulation that's driven by both the marketplace and the producing country that drives business to be more involved with adaptation as well. When business sees that, there is a business case and business, to answer your question, Salim, innovates. Business mm -hmm. innovates when there is a clear reason as a car company to shift to electric. You put billions of euros into solving that problem. When it's about your reputation or you have to do it, it's slower. And mm -hmm. innovation comes from market opportunity. That's what we need to find for adaptation. Excellent, excellent. Great, great ideas. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, uh, Tom, let me ask uh, uh, a question that's come for you from uh, Laurie Goring at Thomson Reuters Foundation. She asks, why have governments been so slow to alter their approach to financing and adaptation projects when the evidence is so clear that they are largely not working? Tom, any insight on that? There are a number of different dimensions here. And Laurie, thank you for the question. The first is, I don't think necessarily evidence held locally is that clear that they're not working. I think that we're beginning to see a body of evidence internationally across multiple different studies to highlight that. But I think this is emerging. Uh, and yes, it's been around for some time, but a real stock take of that locally, I think is important now to really just take the portfolio of actions that have happened around adaptation in a particular country or region, and to look at the collective impact of those, not just one by one, but across the set. And that process of looking at, at the impact has to involve multiple voices, multiple stakeholders, 
It cannot be done by an external evaluation agency coming to assess the project against the pre-agreed framework. It has to be based on learning and sense making across that mix. I think secondly, in terms of the financial picture, my contention would be is that there has been too much reliance on an international system delivering the type of funding that has been promised. Rightly so, but equally I think that has actually created a situation where people are looking outwards for that money and that that money is coming in disappointing ways. And so what I would say is that there are countries such as Bangladesh, the one that you work in, Salim, where there has been huge experience of adaptation on the front line of this challenge, but that there are community organizations and SMEs and startups and government support and so on, which gives Bangladesh an excellent opportunity of, of really leading, not just in terms of the thoughts and the ways of working, but leading in terms of the the uh, financial models, the economic models, and in the innovation space. And I think increasingly we're seeing that. There's a GEF uh, component that is looking to support that bottom-up um, innovation-led approach and so on. But I think we really need to ask ourselves, what is the model choice here? For me, the model choice is now much more around, let's seize the moment locally. Let's treat it as an opportunity for growth, for job creation, for local solutions. And let's stop relying necessarily so much on an international system that will likely just deliver hardcore metrics and technology solutions. I'm being a bit blunt, but I'm mm -hmm. thinking that there is a um, real, real opportunity now and we're seeing countries stepping forward. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. So, uh, Claire, um, uh, a question for you from Cyril Effiong. He asks, um, climate finance keeps reducing from the international to the local. How can these chain be reduced so that the access can be directly accessed by local communities? Um, I know you've done quite a lot of this on this uh, at IID, Claire. Do you want to share some of your lessons? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we've, we've been uh, under a rubric called Money Where It Matters. Um, we've been looking for examples of where finance is channeled to the local level. And sometimes that's through uh, government setting up something like social protection or devolving climate finance to, to local governments. Sometimes it's social movements that set it up from the bottom up and say, in this landscape, we've organized ourselves. We're gonna try and do these things, um, give us funding to help us deliver those objectives. And sometimes it might be um, a private sector led approach of saying, well, there's lots of interesting enterprise in this space that we want to fund, but it's all too small for us to fund uh, individually. So they set up an aggregation platform. Um, Sun Thunder, for example, in the renewables space is an example of that. Um, so these we've been calling delivery mechanisms and we've been looking for them actively of what, what works, which are the ones that are most successful and what it is that, that drives this type of success. And I think this is the answer. We have to move, as, as Gebru said so eloquently earlier, we have to move to business unusual. We have to move to a, a process where everybody's running around. As soon as you've got a grant, you're delivering it, but you're also looking for the next grant to do the next thing. Um, we got to move from that process to having approaches where um, finance is available at the local level. You know what budget you've got. You collectively work to decide how it gets spent. Or in an enterprise situation, you know, business advice is provided alongside climate advice, alongside the loan. Um, those types of mechanisms do exist. We don't have enough of them. And that, that's what the LDC uh, Life AR initiative is seeking to do. That's what the social movements work around frontier funds or frontline funds is seeking to do. So we just need to build this movement of actually creating the mechanisms that, that allow that flexible finance to get to the local level and drive the type of change we're looking for. Great, thank you very much, Claire. We are coming towards the end of our allotted time. So I'm going to invite Vel uh, to share some final thoughts and also answer one of the questions that was addressed to him, which is what's going to happen with the UK reducing its uh, overseas development uh, assistance budget from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5? Is that happening? And if so, what are the repercussions of that? Thanks, Salim. Always nice to end with a very <laughs> simple question. Um, <laughs> So, so look, I mean, the government has announced that the UK's aid budget will reduce from 0.7 uh, of GNI to 0.5 GNI, but will return to 0.7 as the kind of conditions allow. So, so that is happening, and we are working through all of those implications now. Um, 
One thing I would say, I'll, I'll say two things. One is uh, we remain one of the largest donors. You know, the absolute volume of aid is still extremely high and I think still keeps us in the you know, top three of international donors. So um, that in absolute terms, it's still a significant amount of international um, aid finance. Uh, and the second thing I'd say is that within that, we have uh, protected the climate finance um, portion of that. So our commitment to doubling climate finance and, and uh, that remains uh, in place. So, um, but I, of course, I, I totally hear and we have heard the concerns of, of many people about those, about those changes. Um, uh, so I, I guess that's the best answer I can give to that set of questions, mm -hmm. Celine. I did see some other questions in there about the kind of overall system. And I just, I mean, I think we've answered those questions through other speakers, but mm -hmm. I really just wanted to make two points, if I may. One is, just to really uh, reinforce Gebru and Claire's comments about life AR and the kind of potential approach, change in approach that that could bring, uh, I think is potentially really powerful. That's why we've been quite keen to kind of support it. Uh, and it's it's a long-term patient, it's gonna be hard work, but I think it's it really goes to some of those system approaches of not siloing this, about integrating all the different agendas, about taking a whole of government approach, but then also thinking about how that interacts at local level. So I just wanted to say, I think that's a potentially quite powerful mechanism. Um, and then the other reflection, I guess, hearing the conversation has been, one of the challenges of adaptation is outside of the disaster risk reduction space, you know, there aren't a huge number of pure adaptation initiatives. A lot of adaptation is how you are um, doing development differently. So how are you doing a social protection initiative slightly differently that so it can be as well as hunger resilient, it can be um, climate resilient. How are you doing an economic development program that is not just about job creation, but it's about also being kind of resilient and kind of is adapting and recognizing physical climate risk. So when you start to kind of have this sort of doing development differently, it, it changes the nature of the discussion. So when you're looking at those projects, what by which metric are you measuring those projects? Are you measuring them on a development basis? On the, so I think, um, but I also think this is a relatively, um, it's an area that is less mature in terms of its evidence base, as I think has really come out of this conversation, certainly something I, uh, I recognize and, you know, there's gonna be an adaptation research alliance launching at COP26, which is partly to help us build that evidence base. And I think it's really important. Um, so I, I think, just the, the, the general point, which I really hear and I recognize is that the, the sort of the maturity of the intervention space in adaptation is probably behind other areas like health and education. So and we need to kind of close that gap. But, but I just wanted to conclude just by saying it's a really important discussion. I think a fabulous collection of speakers. I've really learned a lot. And um, uh, I think it's just been really useful and helps kind of keep the momentum and the trajectory going for the rest of the year. Thank you very much, Val. And, and uh, before I conclude and thank all our speakers and participants, uh, I'll just share a couple of thoughts from my side. Uh, firstly, on the issue of linking the global with the local, which we've had quite a lot of discussion around. I mentioned earlier the Gobeshana conference that I ran uh, uh, last month. Uh, Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research, and it's the name of a platform of uh, more than 50 universities and research institutes, mainly based in Bangladesh that have been uh, developing knowledge sharing platforms. And we had a, a big annual conference every year in January, used to be a physical conference at my university in Dhaka. Uh, we would get quite a lot of international participants, but they had to fly to Dhaka uh, to participate. This year in January, uh, because of the pandemic and the travel restrictions, we decided to go online and as we were going online, we also decided to go global and invite participants from all over the world uh, to participate on the theme of locally led adaptation. And we got an astounding response from uh, friends and partners all over the world. And we eventually ran more than 90 sessions, 24 seven, over seven days, 24 hours. We had eight hour segments for the Asia Pacific zone followed by eight hours for Africa and Europe time zones, followed by eight hours for the Americas, North, South and Central time zones, and then back again seven times uh, over seven days. And it was amazing. We connected with people all over the world. And, and one of the big connections we had, and Sheila made reference to this, Cairo with the European Union, the, the local adaptation taking place all over the world is very local, 
but there's a lot to be shared across borders. We had Emma Howard uh, Boyd from the UK talking about the impacts in the UK. At that time, there was a storm going on there, and she had been out there with, uh, with the Prime Minister Boris Johnson looking at local adaptation taking place in the UK, and there were lessons that we can actually share across borders. So, you know, to Tom's uh, European friends, we had Jean Pascal Lipercel from uh, the European uh, 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 from Europe talking about the European plan as well and talking about how we can share knowledge across local adaptation across the world and that to me is a very big opportunity that we have just scratched the surface of and we hope to be doing more of uh, from now on so we with the Gobeshna conference from now is going to be, remain permanently online we don't have to fly to Dhaka to participate anymore but you have to come and join us online and I invite everybody to join us again next year in January 2022 and for the next decade on this 10 year journey. Uh, the other uh, uh, different topic I want to raise is that uh, this year there is also another major UN uh, conference. It's called the UN Food Systems Summit, which will be taking place in October. And I have been invited by the uh, UN to chair one of five action tracks uh, the Action Track 5 on, act, on Resilience, uh, which is a very innovative way of doing a meeting. This is not a traditional government negotiated summit. This is about inviting uh, voices from all over the world to give inputs and then to come up with a number of action agendas that different organizations, different groups, farmers groups, uh, uh, consumer groups, uh, private sector, uh, everybody is able to bring together governments and then at the summit, a set of these will then be presented and endorsed and supported, and those will go into action for the next decade. And uh, it's not just agreeing some agreed text uh, negotiated by governments, which is a traditional manner that we in the UNFCC at the COPS are, are used to having a process uh, where governments do this uh, decisions on, on uh, uh, text. So again, another opportunity to bring this notion of resilience to food systems, which has a lot of resonance with climate change resilience as well. Um, and then the final point I'll just share is the fact that, as many people will be aware, there is this uh, climate vulnerable forum of political leaders that has been working together nearly 50 vulnerable countries, not negotiating groups like the least developed countries, but at the political level by heads of government, which is currently chaired by my Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh for the next two years. They have been working at the political level for a number of years, but in the last few years, they have also had a, uh, a section of uh, a separate uh, initiative of the finance ministers. They call themselves the V20, but they're actually uh, 48 countries of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, finance ministers have been meeting and finance ministers don't go to climate negotiations. They don't get involved in climate, uh, you know, climate finance, but they have budgets. They have their own budgets at the national level. And these finance ministers are actually quite willing to spend their own budgets to build adaptation and resilience in their own countries. And they're not looking for handouts from the rest of the world. They are looking to optimize their own investments in their own country. And that's something to me, a very great opportunity for us to engage with our own finance ministers in the vulnerable countries and to ensure that the budgets that we do have, the national budgets are used and directed to enhance resilience and uh, in, enable adaptation of our own uh, citizens. And this is not something that we have to look to the rest of the world to come to our rescue, but we can do ourselves. So uh, having said that, let me take this opportunity for thanking all our uh, distinguished panelists and speakers for excellent contributions, all the participants for staying with us and for asking questions, and to my colleagues in IID and ICAD uh, who helped organize this event. I'm sure we will be uh, sending out uh, information on uh, how to access the recording and the outputs from this uh, uh, after the event is over. So I hope everybody, we have everybody's email addresses so we can share all of that with you. Uh, and with that, let me thank you all and uh, uh, wish you a good evening from Dhaka.